Okay, what's happening on Monday? Who will be on time? <laughs> yes, um, you may have as long as you like, but don't get here after people have finished because you can take your exams with you. Um, so um, I have had, and I've mentioned this before, um, someone apparently spent too long studying, was here on time, slept for the first half hour of my exam. I've put people to sleep in my lectures before, but never for my exams. <laughs> Um, but it was fine. You know, this person was able to take as long as they needed and finished up the exam. So I can't remember how well they did, but that's a different story. So again, um, for those of you who have not had the luxury of having my courses before, this is all old stuff and stuff that I wanted to go over again, uh, with one little exception that I modified from Dr. Nacho's lecture. Um, but other than that, it's all old stuff, um, but stuff that I thought deserved going over again. There is no guarantee whatsoever if any or all of this stuff will end up on the exam on Monday. Um, and you may want the weekend to study. I need the weekend to write the exam. So both of us will be, or all of us will be working on this thing. So um, what do I mean by this? Um, that viruses are not just virions. So this the big difference between a virus and a virion, and of course this is one of my favorite virions um, here, not the pipe in the corner. Uh, the other thing, again, just going right back to the beginning, virions are absolutely everywhere, and that of course probably means that viruses are everywhere as well. Um, just very, very, very large numbers of these things. And this is something which most virologists and definitely most of the general public don't really think about too much. And I just posted a link to a paper where they look at deposition of virions in this case, they call them viruses, but deposition of virions from the atmosphere. And it's literally billions of virions that fall out of the atmosphere on a daily basis. Um, so there's a blog post about that if you're interested in taking a look at it. But again, it just means that you know, virions are absolutely everywhere and we know very, very little about what the vast majority of them actually do. Of course, Virions are what define viruses, that, that extracellular form which allows the virus genome to get from one host to the next. And this is the thing which is really bizarre and different about viruses. They have these virions as part of that life cycle. That's partly why we spend so much time talking about the virions themselves, how they get put together, how the genome gets released from each of these virions, um, et cetera. And so we've just barely started to scratch the surface of some of these. Talked a little bit about tobacco mosaic virus, a little bit about polio virus. Some of these variability that you have in those little green dots that we just looked at, uh, if you look at them under the electron microscope, Many of them have these head and tail like structures, which should look a lot like various different bacteriophage. Uh, but there are also a very large number that have these non tailed structures. And this is what we didn't get to in the lecture on Wednesday. If we didn't get to it in lecture, it's not going to be on the exam, at least not on this exam. So that's great. It's wonderful. But again, we know very little about what most of these virions are doing. We don't know what most of them are infecting, et cetera. But the ones that we do know about, how do we know about them? And one of the major things that virologists do is they want to count the number of viruses. They also try and count virions. So counting viruses, just looking at infection. And so you're interested in animal viruses, you can count infection. If you want to count virions, electron microscopy is a reasonable way to do that. But if you really are interested in infectivity and you have a system you can do this with, and this is definitely not true for many viruses, plaque assays are really wonderful ways to do that. And it bears repeating this because plaque assays are what virologists do all the time. And a lot of the stuff that we know about these viruses comes from looking at these plaque assays. So the whole idea is you have a suspension of your viruses. This could be virions. It could it actually be viruses as well, some infected cells. Do dilution series and then take these highly diluted, so we'll call them infectious virions, and put them in a vast excess of cells. 
and those cells will grow. That's what the orange is here in the background. In some cases, they won't, or there's some indication that there's a virus infection there. That's what these plaques end up being. This is a statistical measure, and so you'll, you should do multiple plates until you run out of undergraduates to do all the plates for you, um, and then do an average of all of these. So it's really a statistical measure for looking at. In this case, so we've got a dilution of 10 to the 8th, an average of 12 plaques per plate. It was one mil that we put in each of these plates. So you have a oh, 1.2 times 10 to the 9 titer for your infectious virions. Or you can also say PFUs per mil. Um, why do we care about PFUs per mil? Yeah, A gives us an idea of how many of those otherwise invisible infectious virus particles we have in our preparation, but also really important for looking at virus infection. And so as I mentioned right way back at the beginning, weeks and weeks ago, about two and a half, uh, was that studying an individual virion infecting a single cell is doable, but it's really, really, really hard. So it's much better to look at a population of viruses going through their life cycle synchronously. So the way you do this, you have a synchronous infection at a high MOI, and we'll talk about the Poisson distribution in just a second here, multiplicity of an infection. And then all you do is do plaque assays or some other way of measuring either infectious virus particles, which is this black line here, or you can be looking at viral DNA, the orange line. You can be looking at viral messenger RNA as this dashed orange line. You can be looking at some virus proteins. This particular one is a very early protein, a dashed black line. You can be looking at the capsid proteins, this other black dashed line, but with shorter dashes. So many different things you can get out of this and look at how the viruses are replicating and how they're going through their life cycle. So this is a really critical process that for any given virus and any given host system, um, you really want to be able to set up one of these one-step growth curves. Easier said than done but definitely a, a goal of something to set up. And so you can learn a lot of different things from this. One of them has to do with burst sizes. And so the burst size is how many infectious virions you get per infected cell. And so here, the burst size is on the order of, this is a log scale, so it's about seven or 800 PFUs per infected cell. And that's not unusual that you get hundreds of PSUs per infected cell. So very, very large numbers of infectious virions um, in this process. So any questions? Oh, by the way, you have to stop me as I go along, because otherwise I will just zoom through stuff. Yeah? So this would be a good way to study uh, viral haplogenesis or pathogenesis? OK, so the question is, would this be a good way to um, study virus pathogenesis? It really depends on how you define pathogenesis. I would say in this case, you're just looking at cells, because you're looking at a, a plaque assay. And so you're just looking at cells per se. So the cellular infectivity, yes. If you think about pathogenesis, usually people think about pathogenesis in terms of a disease phenotype. And so if you're thinking about a virus like this one, which actually is simian virus 40, um, this is not necessarily going to tell you very much about disease because that's going to be your whole organism. Well, if so it's what would be a good way to study that then? Because I just remember we had on one of your classes tests animal work. Yes. So you're going to have to study whole animals. If you're going to study disease, you really want to study whole animals or at least whole organisms. Now, if we're talking single-celled organisms, that's a different story. But for the most part, if you're thinking about old exams, and I did, by the way, post the um, exam from last year without answers on it, just last night. So that was done, even though I didn't get a reminder email. Um, so but yes, the, um, if you're really interested in studying disease, you want to be looking at a, usually it's a response of the whole organism to that virus infection. Um, as you've probably noticed so far, I'm pretty virocentric. So I'm going to be talking a lot more about the viruses than I am going to be talking about the host. So we'll get to some of those when we talk about the diseases later on in the class. <clears throat> so um, everyone knew that when they were signing up for virology that they would be doing lots of math and statistics, right? Um, so this is the, well, one of the two 
kinds of math that are likely to be on the exam. Um, the Poisson distribution, I will give you the equation. Don't worry. Um, you will not need a calculator for this exam. Um, so if there is a question like this, and some of you have seen them probably on old exams, I will give you like an extra sheet or I'll throw something up on the projector that will give you all the numbers you need. Um, but the basic idea here is, again, this is a statistical distribution. If you think about number of infectious virus particles versus number of cells. If you just mix one to one, they're going to be a pretty high proportion, about 13%, of your cells that are never going to see a virion. So if you care about doing a synchronous infection, this is not a good way to go because you're going to have 13% of your cells that are not infected. So um, that's the main reason to think about the Poisson distribution. And then there's some other things that we'll talk about later on in the course having to do with, again, these statistical interactions of just large numbers of individual particles interacting with each other in a random process. This is now Dr. Nacho's lecture. I um, want to spend a little bit more time talking about some of these things. A few people have asked me, um, both online and in office hours, um, do we need to know the different Baltimore classes? We don't need to know the numbers of the different Baltimore classes, but you need to know about these different Baltimore classes. And it's really all about the messenger RNA and how you get to the messenger RNA. And to some extent, and this thing I, I didn't emphasize, I think, enough in previous rounds, and hopefully Nacho did, is the enzymes which are required for this process. So the easy one, of course, is double-stranded DNA, host enzymes, host DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, makes your messenger RNA. So this is really easy. You don't need any extra, at least not viral, enzymes in the process. Single-stranded DNA, this, of course, we talked about for FIX-174. You have to have a DNA polymerase to make double-stranded DNA before you can make messenger RNA. Um, for FIX-174, it's not a viral polymerase. It's just using a host polymerase. But there are viral proteins that are required to allow that to happen. And we'll talk about that. It's the A protein in the case of FIX-174. So these guys we've talked about. We've talked about positive strand RNA viruses. This is MS2 and Q-beta. This can be used directly for translation. And it turns out, yes, you do translate these immediately. So these positive strand RNA viruses are great because as soon as you have the release of the genome inside the cell, then that can be translated and make the proteins that you need. However, one of those proteins has to be a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So it uses an RNA template to make RNA. Um, there are not cellular, well, not very many cellular RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, and all viruses use a viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make the negative strand RNA from which more messenger RNA and, of course, more genomes are being made. Negative strand RNAs, again, so this is you know, packaged inside the virion, these have to not only encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, they have to have that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the virion and bring it into the cell when you have an infection. Because this cannot be translated. Where is the virus going to get this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase from? It's encoded here, but it's in code because it's on the opposite strand. So these guys have to bring their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Turns out that double-stranded RNA viruses do the same thing, although at least in theory, this light green strand here um, is positive strand and could be used. So theoretically, all you need is an RNA helicase but then you will eventually need to encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So these are all of our RNA viruses, the ones that we've skipped so far. And this is why David Baltimore, who came up with all these classes, got the Nobel Prize, just had his 80th birthday uh, about three weeks ago, a little over a month ago, um, and said he's finally closing down his lab after like 60 years or something like that. So, um, but. <clears throat> Early on in his career, he discovered that there were these RNA viruses together with Howard Temin that packaged RNA but had a DNA intermediate in terms of their replication. This RNA to DNA is dependent on reverse transcriptase. Again, this is a viral protein that's used for this reverse transcription. 
has to be present in the virion as well when that protein comes in, uh, sorry, when the genome comes inside the cell. Um, and actually, it's kind of interesting because, at least in theory, you should be able to translate this and it would be able to make a reverse transcriptase. But it turns out that's not the case, so it's actually kind of like these double stranded RNAs over here. It makes a negative strand DNA, and I don't like what Nacho put here, a DNA polymerase. This is actually also the reverse transcriptase that does this job, um, making double-stranded DNA. And these double-stranded DNAs then will be transcribed into messenger RNA. Yeah? So the class 6. Mm -hmm. So it carries its own reverse trans transcriptase machinery with it in the Yeah, so all of the retroviruses, and I'm not going to call them class 6 because I yeah. don't expect you to remember those numbers. That's fine. <laughs> Um, all the retroviruses are going to carry a reverse transcriptase with them in the virion. Yeah? So out of those four, the only one that translates its own machinery before using it is what's classed as four up there. Yeah, what's listed. So positive strand RNA viruses. That can just be the RNA which comes inside the cell, but also the double-stranded DNA viruses. Because as soon as you get a double-stranded DNA virus inside the cell, also all the cell machinery can do, do its job with it. That's sort of the idea. The ones that really do not require any kind of enzymatic activity before you can start making proteins um, of the, that would be this one because it's just translation. Here you are going to have to have cellular RNA, so DNA dependent RNA polymerases, which will do that. Okay, more questions on these. This is, this is a very important point. People talk about these all the time and sort of a big overview of everything else. Yeah, just Nicole. Mm -hmm. gets uh, copied to the negative strand RNA. That's the positive strand RNA. The mRNA is copied from the negative strand, not the positive RNA. Okay, so the Nicole's question here is basically, um, and this is a little on the confusing side, so uh, I hopefully accept my apologies on this. So. Um, the question, again, if I understand it correctly, is, is messenger RNA always made from negative strand RNA? That's one way of putting it. And the answer is, not always. Um, you'll have some, and this is what we talked about with MS2, um, and it's going to be true for a bunch of the other positive strand RNA viruses that we'll talk about after the midterm, um, that is, um, can be translated and is translated um, early on in the process. Um, and as we'll see later on, lots of the other messenger RNAs, particularly true for some of the other positive strand RNA viruses, will be made from negative strand RNA. Okay. It actually ends up being both. Okay. Does that have to do with the issue of the uh, replicase and the mRNA, or um, ribosome RNA? Thing? So replicase and messenger RNA running into each other, that's one potential reason why that happens, um, as it, again, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there will there'll be the other thing is again so yes one problem is clearly replicates running into your ribosome but then you also have the issue of making a whole bunch more of some proteins and less of other proteins so your structural proteins you need to make a lot more of than you do of your non-structural proteins and so when we get there you'll know all about it and it'll be easy but it won't be on the exam so we can skip it for the time being <clears throat> Another thing that I wanted to mention again that uh, hopefully Nacho talked about um, has to do with how we get all of these beautiful structures. And I brought my bag of toys here with me um, in terms of all of our different virus structures. Um, the vast majority of them, particularly these days, are made through cryo-electron microscopy and image reconstruction. Um, and that comes from this idea of basically taking many, many pictures of your favorite virus, and these end up being 2D pictures, and through a lot of really, excuse me, cool software, um, which is one of the reasons, and one of the people got the Nobel Prize for this last year, um, for cryo-electron microscopy, is lining all of these particles up relative to each other, and then combining them into a 3D image. And this is, again, how we've gotten the vast majority of the whole virion structures that we will be looking at through the rest of the class and which are absolutely amazing and gorgeous as far as I'm concerned. Um, so <clears throat> what a lot of these look like, 
basically two major classes of virions. We've got helical virions, and helices are actually really, really good because those, again, now smaller is better, at least as far as number of proteins involved in putting together your virion is concerned. So if you think about an individual capsid protein, just shown here by this sort of, I don't know, I, wouldn't, I, not, I can't call it a swoosh, I don't think. I would probably get sued. Um, but <laughs> apostrophe or little, you know, extra piece here. Basically, this just represents one of your capsid proteins. And we'll see this when we look at the icosahedral symmetry in just a second here. But if you look at this particular protein, it's associated with all the proteins around it in exactly the same way as this protein, as this protein, and as this protein, because the whole thing is wrapped around. So these are absolutely equivalent interactions that they have with each other. The only thing which is different, of course, is what happens here at the ends. So if there weren't an end problem, this would be by far and away the best way to be packaging your nucleic acid. The other thing, of course, is that things start to get kind of long after a while because nucleic acid is actually pretty inefficient in terms of its coating capacity. And that's probably why we have all of these geometrically simple structures in terms of putting virions together. So that works again if you've got something which is a relatively small and short process. On the other hand, if you've got something which is big, again, it's all about the geometry. You want to have something that approximates a sphere. What best approximates a sphere? That's going to be an icosahedron. So for icosahedral symmetry, um, we've got these wonderful structures. And yes, I've got my soccer ball with me today. Uh, we've got five-fold axes of symmetry. We've got two-fold axes of symmetry, which is just you know, rotate 180 degrees. Let's see, where's, where's my two-fold axis here? find these eventually. Two-fold axis of symmetry, and then a three-fold axis of symmetry that you can rotate around in terms of 120 degrees. And that that's defines an icosahedron, that you've got five-fold axis of symmetry, two-fold axis of symmetry, and three-fold axis of symmetry. Um, and the reason, again, that this is such a good way of packaging your nucleic acid is it's a regular structure, so you're using identical proteins to get a pretty big structure. Of course, you have the problem of making more and more of those individual proteins. So again, why icosahedral symmetry? Um, a couple of people came to me in office hours, and forget who it was, but mentioned that 60 is the number to remember, um, which is a really good number to remember. Uh, because if you think about the number of different of axes, <coughs> excuse me, of ways that you can look at these things, you know, 12 five-fold rotation axes, so 12 times 5 is 60, 23 folds, which is 60, and 32 folds, all 60. How many capsid subunits do you have? Again, with these little curly cues, I guess, uh, relative to each other, this is a regular icosahedron. You, all you have is five capsid protein subunits at every five-fold axis that interact with each other, again, five-fold axis of symmetry, two-fold axis of symmetry, three-fold axis of symmetry. This is your t equals one icosahedrally symmetric particle. Unfortunately, 60 subunits is only enough for a couple of thousand nucleotides. And as we well know, there are quite a few virus genomes that have way more than a couple of thousand nucleotides that are going to be packaged in any given virion. So how do you deal with this? You make a soccer ball. Um, and the idea here, and this is where the difference is, that one difference I said between my lecture and Nacho's lecture. Um, I put in six-fold axes of symmetry here. Really, I think a better way to think about this is hexamers between pentamers. So the pentamers, again, this is what's going to be your five-fold axis of symmetry. You add hexamers in between. And it turns out, at least theoretically, you can add a infinite number of hexamers between any of those individual pentamers and make a icosahedrally symmetric structure, in some cases ridiculously huge, like Mimi virus, which is one of the largest virions, not quite anymore, um, of any virus known to date. And so icosahedrally symmetric, all it is is adding extra hexamers relative to the pentamers. Now, a lot of people have asked me what the heck is meant by quasi-equivalence. Uh, so the idea here is that 
equivalent would be what you have in t equals 1. Because all of those capsid proteins are interacting with each other in exactly the same way. So these got five tails that are interacting with each other and always interacting with three heads. Here, you're still interacting with three heads, but you have some of now exactly the same protein, which is interacting with five others instead of with four others. So the whole idea of the quasi-equivalence is it's the same protein with slightly different structures. And again, fives versus sixes. I don't know if Nacho talked about pseudo quasi equivalence. What the heck is pseudo quasi equivalence? And Stedman puts it on his exams all the time. So, <laughs> if you've looked at some of the old exams, yes. Um, so, the whole thing with a pseudo quasi equivalence. So, quasi equivalence is the same capsid protein. As soon as you start to use a different capsid protein, then a pseudo quasi equivalent. So, if you have multiple different proteins that are used, still fit together in a similar way, that's going to be a pseudo, and usually just listed as a P. So pseudo T equals 3. Polio is a really good example of a pseudo T equals 3. Now, how do you get your triangulation number? This is the other equation. Um, I won't give you this equation. I do expect you to know it. Um, your T number is H, square, H squared plus HK plus K squared. How do you get H and K? You hop from one five-fold axis of symmetry to the next five-fold axis of symmetry. In one of these t equals three particles, hop here, one, change direction, so now it's k, hop in another direction. Up here, we have a t equals four. Here, we just hop one, two in one direction, or from here, one, two in one direction. And so that's a t equals four quasi-equivalent icosahedra. And I actually have some models up here that you can come and take a look at. Some of them are T3, some of them are T4. Actually, just one of them is T4. Um, so I will actually be here, just a quick reminder, um, after class, there's no class that comes in here afterwards, so we'll have office hours actually in here instead of over in my office. And if people need extra office hours, email me, uh, or email me over the weekend in terms of more questions. So uh, a great example of a pseudo quasi-equivalent structure is adenovirus. So here, nice that all of these spikes stick out at the five-fold axis of symmetry, but this is a different protein now. It's not the same protein that is involved with all of the hexons. And of course, it's conveniently named hexon and penton. Um, where you find these, basically what you need to do is get from one of these pentons to the next penton. They're all in a straight line. So let's see if we can find, here's a nice penton. Here's a nice penton. We go one, two, three, four, five, all in one direction. What does that mean? Five. Right, five squared, which is 25. And it's a pseudo t equals 25 because they're different proteins. Hexons are different than pentons. Make sense? Yes, happy, no? It is very hard to see on this one. Yeah, they are all on the edge. Um, you can squint a little bit, you can see them. If I were to give you a question like this on an exam, I would actually give you the outline of the structures rather than actually give you something like this, which is really hard to tell. So, <laughs> yes, and now what's, what's the T number of a golf ball? No, just, some of them are, are really interesting, but I won't do that to you. Um, so <clears throat> there, of course, this is, um, you know, that a sphere or an icosahedron is a good way to package things is not something that viruses came up with. Um, it's used in many other kinds of <clears throat> interactions. This is um, from Montreal. Um, Expo, I think this turned out to be a T equals um, 79 or something like that structure. I asked people to do this in previous years, um, not anymore. Um, this is a nice example of a T equals 3 uh, process. But there are also variations on this theme. And in many cases, there'll be ends of virions that have these icosahedral symmetric structures, but extra bits that get, get added in between. When we talk about the HIV-1 structure, much later on in the course, we'll see it's got two different 
icosahedral ends, and in the middle, um, a whole bunch of these hexameric structures that come together, and maybe our favorite virus, SSV1, has a similar structure to this as well. And then, of course, you know, soccer balls are ones that have really nice T equals 3 structures. So again, I'll have all these up here um, after class today, and if people want to come and take a look at them, ask questions, um, please feel free to do so. Okay, any more questions on quasi-equivalence at this point, icosahedral symmetry? Um, well, again, almost all of the virions we'll talk about the rest of the class will have icosahedral symmetry. Few will have helical symmetry. Um, so we talked really briefly about virus envelopes and virus envelope proteins. Um, that was before we talked about entry and receptors. So not surprisingly, these virus proteins now, so any kind of envelope virus has a lipid membrane on the outside. This is always derived from cellular lipids. Um, none of the viruses make their own lipids, um, although some interesting exceptions to that, as always, you know, it's biology. Uh, but they will all, all of these are going to have some kind of viral protein that sticks through that membrane. And that makes perfect sense because somehow this virion has to associate with the host cell. How is it going to associate with the host cell? Through the receptors that we talked about in terms of entry. And these are going to be your receptor binding proteins. So as I mentioned, virus receptors on cells can be pretty much anything. They can be sugars, we talked about that. They can be lipids. They can be proteins. What the virus is going to interact with, that receptor interaction part of the virus, is always a protein. So your receptor binding protein. Um, and this is just an example of these here. We'll also see that these receptor binding proteins have a tendency to be multimeric proteins as well. So dimers or trimers for the most part. Uh, most of these viral envelope proteins for animal viruses are going to be glycosylated. So they'll have modifications to the protein um, and this addition of, of various different sugars. Often they will also have disulfide bonds. That's what these green things are supposed to mention here. I want to talk again briefly about icosahedral, sorry, helical symmetry as opposed to icosahedral symmetry. This is more to do with genome packaging. Um, when I talked about genome packaging before, I talked about a groove being a way that you can package a nucleic acid. Um, this is a relatively high resolution structure of tobacco mosaic virus. We'll look at it again later. But the individual capsid protein subunits kind of look like a wooden shoe. Um, and where your foot would go in the wooden shoe is exactly where the nucleic acid gets put. Um, did want to mention also briefly, we've got our T number in terms of describing icosahedral structures. The pitch of a helix is just the equivalent. Um, I don't expect you to remember all the details on here, but that the pitch is another way of describing, instead of talking about where each of these subunits is relative to each other, that will give you a bit of an idea of what these helical structures look like in a manner very similar to thinking about the T number. Okay, so um, I showed you this virosphere before. Um, what I forgot to bring, because I was too lazy, um, was the book. So I, I threatened you with virus taxonomy. Um, this is the book um, of virus taxonomy. This is actually the ninth edition. The tenth edition is the more recent one. But what I wanted to mention is maybe a little hard to see here. Maybe I should turn the lights up a bit. Um, is how these things are being classified. And it's really about the different kinds of genomes. And so maybe a little hard to see in the back here. But basically, each of these colored segments represents um, those different kinds of virus parts. So this green one here at the top, which is maybe a centimeter and a half, that's your DNA viruses. These guys here, the pink one, are all your positive strand RNA viruses. So this is really just how it's being classified. It's literally, OK, what kind of genome do they have, and who do they infect? Um, most of these ones here are going to be plant viruses. Many of these are going to be bacterial and archaeal viruses um, up here at the top. And I'll just leave this here again if people would like to come and you know, have a little light reading. Um, they're welcome to come and take a look at that. Um, so this is how viruses were classified. A much better way to classify them is if you have some sequence similarity, you can start to think about genomes and then a actual phylogeny, this is just taxonomy, naming things, um, actually how they're related to each other, it's much more worthwhile to have sequences. But the problem with 
virus genomes, they don't have any completely conserved genes. So how do you make a phylogeny if you don't have conserved genes? Um, and as we'll see, the one of the ways that I like to think about these kinds of phylogenies is using virus structures. So I brought some more toys with me. Um, these are some virus structure models of various completely different viruses, we'll talk about it in just a second, that are made up of basically identical molecular structures. But sequence wise, you can't see any similarity between them. So um, we can talk about that. And again, people can come up and take a look at these a little bit later on. So a few people asked me, you know, what, do I, what do you expect us to know for the exam in terms of DNA viruses, RNA viruses, et cetera? Um, the ones that we've talked about in detail, again, the RNA phage, the FIX-174 and T7, there's definitely going to be a number of questions on those. But just in general, DNA viruses are, have the smallest genomes and the largest genomes. Um, and the very smallest are actually less than 2,000 base pairs and the largest ones are you now 2.5 million actually plus they found some ones that are even slightly bigger than that. So massive amount of variability, particularly important are these single stranded DNA viruses and actually a lot of these DNA, DSDNA viruses, which you find infecting all different kinds of organisms. So plants, animals, bacteria, archaea, you name it, they're all over the place. RNA viruses, we, you know, talked about that positive strand RNA virus when we talked about the Baltimore classifications. Those are also extremely common, particularly in plants. Um, and they can get up to thousands of bases in length. Not much more than that. And we'll talk about why that is actually later on when we talk about some of the other ones. Um, negative strand RNA viruses, these are the ones that are often causing nasty diseases. Again, we'll talk about Ebola and flu and some of the other viruses a little bit late, later on. Um, many of these actually have segmented genomes. And so we talked a little bit about segmented genomes. I like to think of segmented genomes as basically being like individual virus chromosomes, um, which then have to be packaged appropriately. And we'll see why having separate chromosomes is a useful thing or a segmented genome um, when we talk about some of these viruses again um, after the midterm. And then these double-stranded DNA viruses, almost all of them have segmented genomes as well. We talked a little bit about the reverse transcriptase viruses or the retroviruses. Retroviruses always package RNA. Um, this is getting into where I disagree with a lot of the other virologists. So some people say there are seven Baltimore classifications. Baltimore himself just said six. Um, what they will call the seventh Baltimore class are these viruses which package DNA in their virions, but still have a reverse transcriptase step, which is absolutely required for their replication and for making messenger RNA. So I will bundle all of these together as the retrovirus or the reverse transcriptase encoding viruses. And again, the classic case of these are HIV, but there are many other different retroviruses and reverse transcriptase encoding viruses that we'll talk about um, again later on in the term. So um, this is again all in that um, virus classification lecture. Um, hopefully, again, Nacho talked about this a little bit. Um, this is why I think that protein structure is a really good way to think about unifying some of this virus taxonomy into a virus phylogeny, again, how they're actually related to each other. So if you look at these three different viruses, this is a major capsid protein structure. And again, I've got various models of them up here at the front. Um, this is one that I discovered. This is STIV, Sulfalobus turdidicosahedral virus from a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park that infects archaea. Turns out that the capsid protein structure here, a double jelly roll structure here, beta barrel, beta barrel, people call these again as double um, <clears throat> jelly roll structures, turns out to be extremely similar in its structure to a bacterial virus, PRD1, and a eukaryotic virus, in this case adenovirus, but also a number of other eukaryote infecting viruses. So what is this? Is it horizontal gene transfer? Is it convergent evolution? Or, as we like to think and tried to sell, um, common ancestor. So there is a phylogeny that you can get from structure even in the absence of sequence similarity. So that's this whole idea that we tried to publish in Science and Nature and it got rejected, um, and then we ended up publishing in PNAS. 
Um, and then the struct another structure came along a little bit later on. So the basic idea here is that structure is conserved, but it's protein structure that's conserved, not the overall structure of an icosylated really symmetric virus, and virion, I should say. Um, those icosylated really symmetric virions you can actually make in lots of different ways, but some of them are really well conserved, and particularly this double jelly roll protein. This is what we talk about, again, bacterial viruses, archaeal viruses, and eukaryotic viruses. Another way of looking at this is in a actual phylogeny, but again, this is not a sequence phylogeny, it's a structural phylogeny, where you have one of these double beta barrels or double jelly roll proteins in viruses that infect archaea, bacteria, and this is also a bacterial virus. This is a eukaryotic virus. This one that we talked about really briefly, this is a virus that infects viruses. So this is one of the satellite viruses or virophage. This is the structure of the major capsid protein of a virus that infects cells that are infected by giant viruses and slows down the growth of all of those giant viruses. So the whole idea here is structure as a way of thinking about phylogeny as opposed to just a you know, sequence-based taxonomy, which you can't do. Questions on this before we move on to talk a little bit more about the virus diversity. So um, basically these new publications, again, Nature Roots Microbiology, take home message here is there are very abundant virus genomes that you find in seawater that we have no idea what they infect and also are not similar to any other kinds of populations. So as mentioned before, if you look through that book, there are about 4,000 different virus species, and here we've got 15,000 probably would also be different virus species. So there's a whole bunch more out there, and we really don't know um, very much about them at all. Again, getting back to all those green dots that we talked about right at the beginning. Um, if you look at just one group of viruses, which do have sequences which are similar to each other, you can make some of these regular phylogenetic trees, and the take-home message here is we know something about this group of viruses, this group of viruses, this group of viruses, this group of viruses, and this group of viruses, but we don't know anything about all of these other groups of viruses, which are clearly related because they've got conserved sequences relative to each other. And as I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, single-stranded DNA viruses seem to infect lots of different things. These are some of those single-stranded DNA viruses that infect lots of different things, but we're not even sure what a whole bunch of these actually infect. So we spent a while talking about virus entry, and this is a slide that is actually basically everything you need to know about virus entry, with a few little exceptions. You've got envelope viruses that fuse with plasma membrane, release a core or capsid structure. In this case, this is a reverse transcriptase virus. This has to get into the nucleus. We have viruses that are enveloped, come into endosomes. What happens in endosomes? pH goes down. Then you have fusion between the envelope and the endosome membrane. You also have receptor-mediated endocytosis that happens with naked viruses that somehow have to escape from this endosome, again, due to a change in pH, but not causing membrane fusion. It's uh, basically a lysis of the endosome in this case. Then these capsids get transported to the nucleus, and at the nuclear membrane, the genome is released. Same thing happens here with an enveloped virus. When it fuses the membrane, again, these capsid particles are transported to the nucleus. Smaller and smaller virions, many of these, actually the virion can get inside the nucleus, and sometimes you actually even have those that come in through different processes, again, all cellular processes, for picking up things from the environment. Um, and this is the calveolins in terms of SV40 that, again, we'll talk about a lot la uh, more later on. In terms of what happens in endosomes, again, it's a change of pH. That change of pH leads to a change in structure. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yes, I'm not going to go through the list because that'll take me too long to find a list here. But a um, classic example here is influenza. And again, we'll talk more about influenza a little bit later on. 
Receptor binding protein, this is a trimeric protein, so as I mentioned we talked about envelope proteins before, very often multimeric proteins, so there are three of these individual proteins that come together. You have binding to receptor up here, and then as you go through the low pH, a change in structure, and that major change in structure is really about taking a hydrophobic part of your protein that is otherwise pretty well hidden and sticking it into a host membrane and then pulling those two membranes together. Again, through multiple conformational changes that happen. The first conformational change that happens is due to receptor binding. The second conformational change is due to a change in the pH in the endosome. And for flu, there's actually yet another change in pH because of the M protein, this matrix protein, that's blocked by one of those drugs, the antidrugs. Yeah. So there are two different things that happen um, in terms of pH changes. So there's the exterior of the virion, that's this guy. So this is our receptor binding protein. Uh, the M2 is in the membrane, which is down here, that the virus is, you know, it's the viral envelope. M2 would be right here. So after you've had this kind of um, fusion, then the M2, again, with these lower pH conditions, will now change the nucleocapsid, which is on the very inside of the cell. So two kinds of pH changes which are happening in flu, which is actually kind of different than most of the other ones. OK, so now let's talk about some of the individual viruses that we've discussed so far. Um, small RNA phage, MS2, and Q-beta, only four proteins. Coat protein, replicase here, RNA-dependent, RNA polymerase. Maturation protein, the only one that you don't really actually, well, one of the two that you don't really need, and a lysis protein. Basically, all you really need to be a functional virus is going to be a coat and a replicase, some way of replicating your genome and some way of packaging that genome. Um, these guys have two extra ones. And then, of course, we have these whole issues that we talked about before. You've got the replicase running into the ribosome, and you have the problem of making a whole bunch more of your structural proteins than you make of your non-structural proteins. So first of these again, running into each other, and then difference in terms of the amount of proteins which you're actually going to make. How is that done in the case of these small RNA phage? It's all about secondary structure in your RNA and alternative secondary structures which form. So first thing that happens, as soon as that genome gets inside the cell, you have translation of the coat protein. And that's because this translational start is not in a strong secondary structure. So you can have the ribosome, and in fact, lots of ribosomes, bind to this start codon and start to translate. As they translate, they're going to disrupt this secondary structure here and here, and that will allow you to make replicase. But this only happens after you've been translating a whole bunch of your coat protein. Uh, then you'll make a small amount of the replicase protein. Termination here, 90% of the ribosomes will fall off of the RNA. Some of them will rebind over here for the replicase. Some of them will go back and rebind at the start. But a few of them stay associated with the RNA and will move along the RNA to start making some of the lysis protein. So again, it's all about secondary structures in the RNA in terms of amounts of protein that are being made. Yeah, Nicole. So, just so I understand, so when the coat protein gets started, it takes the... <laughs> it takes the video away. <laughs> um, it starts translating the... That's hard. Um, it's translating here. Translating it's, it's all translating. Mm -hmm. Which then another ribosome can come in and start translating the replicase? Yeah, so it'll be a different ribosome that will come in and start with the replicase. So these are, this is all about um, binding of ribosomes. And so the only exception to that is going to be the lysis protein where the ribosome has stayed on the RNA. Okay. And that's rare, so it means you have less of that lysis protein. 
more questions on this RNA phage. We'll talk about single-stranded DNA viruses. A uh, big thing about the single-stranded DNA viruses, of course, is that you can't do anything with the single-stranded DNA. It's got to become double-stranded DNA, and then you need to make single-stranded DNA. And at least for FIX-174, we understand a lot about the assembly process that puts these virions together. But just in general, as far as these single-stranded DNA viruses are concerned, it's this going from single-stranded to double-strand and double-stranded to single-strand, which is very different. Again, we know a lot about the structure of FIX-174. It's going to be one of the next virions that I get 3D printed. Don't have it yet. Uh, this is a nice example of a pseudo T equals 1 structure because you've got all of these different proteins, but they're all fitting together as pentamers. So there's not any of this you know, extra hexamers in between. They're just pentamers which all form together. So the main ones are the you know, F protein, we've got the G protein, and then this really bizarre thing here, the H protein, and that's the one which, again, we've got some really new, fascinating, or relatively new, five years old, frightening. Next version of the textbook, I'm sure we'll have this. Um, the H protein, which undergoes this really amazing structural change on interaction with the receptor um, and makes this hole through which the single-stranded DNA gets transported inside the cell. Um, another way of looking at that is here. This is that <clears throat> overview, again, from Ben Fain. We have FIX-174 interacts with the lipopolysaccharide. You have this major conformational change that happens with the H protein, and the genome is injected. Now, whether replication here is helping pull it in is not entirely clear. This is, is very speculative in terms of, of this whole process. But it does seem to be that this now double-stranded, because it's that single strand which is getting squished down into two strands, it's the only way it can fit through this hole, um, is what's being injected into the host. So we'll talk about replication in just a second here, but this is a nice way of looking at that assembly process. Again, we've got just pentamers. Here's that pentamer of F that adds a little bit of your scaffolding protein. G comes on top of it. Again, we're still all pentamers. Those pentamers come together with the external scaffolding protein. And after you have this procapsid that it forms, now you have insertion of the DNA. That DNA makes you a provirion. You lose the scaffolding proteins, and you end up with a mature virion here at the end. But as I hopefully overemphasized here, Big deal with these single-stranded DNA viruses is how you go from single-stranded DNA to double-stranded DNA and back to single-stranded DNA. So single-stranded DNA, as it comes into the cell, again, through this H protein pore, cellular machinery will make double-stranded replicative DNA. This is what's used for translation and, you say, first transcription, then translation of all the viral proteins. Most important of those, as far as replication is concerned, is this A protein, which will cut one of the strands, provide a 3 prime OH, and hook the A protein to the 5 prime end of what's left. This provides the primer for a cellular DNA polymerase, which will replicate its way around the genome, making a new piece of DNA, single-stranded piece, once it gets around to the very beginning, up here at the top, that A protein will cut, make a new 3 prime end, and in the process of making that cut, the 5 prime end will get linked to the 3 prime end of the new strand, and this whole process will go through again and again. So rolling circle replication, because your polymerase is going around and around, and just keeps going, when it gets to the top, stops, makes a new end, and continues to go. Yeah? I actually had a question about the figure on the last slide. Yeah. Uh, is it suggesting that the H protein actually dissociates from the capsid itself? Oh, down here at the bottom? <laughs> so, yeah, does the H protein end up in the membrane? You'll notice a question mark here at the end. So I think the answer is they don't really know. 
um, whether it's associated from the member or associated with the membrane. This has to do with the experimental processes that you use to actually try and figure these out. So, and uh, I'll give you Ben Fain's email address. You can email him and ask him. Okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to mention as far as the D protein, the scaffolding protein is concerned, we had some questions about this in office hours um, and also in the clicker question. Sorry about this, the tree here disappeared. But the take home message here is that it's one D protein that has four different structures. And so it's that external scaffolding protein, again, that's very flexible in terms of the sequence and an evolutionary time scale, but also flexible in terms of its structure. It can form multiple different structures on the outside of these particles in terms of putting them together. Let's finish up talking about T7. One of the things I think I did, didn't do a terribly good job with was talking about the different transcriptional mechanisms for making the different parts of the genome. Um, we did emphasize that this, these early genes are going to be made by the cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And first, you're going to stop any of the cellular defense mechanisms. These are restriction endonucleases. Then you're going to start to block the cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Then you'll make the viral DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is a single subunit and totally wonderful and fast and all that good stuff. But that viral DNA-dependent RNA polymerase binds to a bunch of different promoters. And that's what these ends are supposed to be here. So lots of different promoters binds really well to these promoters right here, which are the ones which are going to be making your structural proteins, and particularly protein 10 here, which is being made from our class 2 promoters and our class 3 promoters. That's what forms the majority of that head structure. We mentioned this as well. Um, how do you get the genome of T4 inside the cell? Small amount is released when you have binding, but then it's the cellular DNA penetrating RNA polymerase transcribing, which is pulling the genome in. Then as soon as you make the viral DNA dependent RNA polymerase, it pulls in the whole rest of the genome. What does that again is this wonderful T7 RNA polymerase, um, and again, DNA dependent RNA polymerase that looks like what kind of structure? A right hand, which is a structure of no, which we know from DNA polymerases, exactly. So this looks a lot like a DNA polymerase, but it's making RNA, which is very strange. And one of the really strange things about it is because usually DNA polymerases need primers. And this one doesn't, which is really amazing. Um, and people don't still completely understand, to my knowledge, um, exactly how that works. Um, but because it's such a good protein at making RNAs, it also makes the RNA, which is used as the primer for the viral DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, which will make multiple copies of the genome. And these multiple copies of the genome, um, I mentioned concatomers down here at the bottom. Um, concatomers are just literally genomes hooked up end to end to end. And you make multiple copies of these. It has to do with recombination at the ends of these genomes, and we're not going to get into those details. Um, but when you're replicating and you've made the DNA for T7, again, you've got multiple copies that are hooked up end to end to end. You somehow have to package these into capsids. And the way that works is that at each of these ends, there's a site for an endonuclease that will cut exactly one piece, one genome size piece, and that's what ends up getting packaged. <sighs> More questions? No clickers now. I'll have a bunch of questions for you on Monday. Yeah, sorry, one more, quick. Oh, concatomers. So concatomers, again, they're just literally genomes hooked up end to end to end. So if you think about the T7 genome starts with you know, gene 0.3 and goes through, I guess, 17 or 18, then you'd have another one that starts at 0.3, goes through 18, another one that goes and just all hooked up one, one next to the other. And then those get chopped into separate pieces in terms of putting them into genome. Now, the reason for that, actually, it's a, thank you for reminding me, why concatomers? Why should you bother with concatomers? Why, why have concatomers? Um, so these are all DNA polymerases. What do DNA polymerases need? 
primers. What are the primers? RNA. What happens to primers? They get chewed up. So do you want to have holes in your genome when you're trying to package them? No. But if you have a concatamer, you've got a way to fill in all, all of these. So you end up with all the way to the ends of your linear genome. So you don't need these obnoxious telomeres to deal with linear genomes. If you make them all end to end to end and then chop them up, that's a way you can deal with having a linear genome. Thank you so much for reminding me to talk about that. So much more sense now. Yes, OK. Yes, yeah, so I'll be here for the next you know, 15, 20 minutes or so if you have more questions. I've got lots of fun toys. Um, and good luck on Monday. <laughs>